May I speak in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, here we are once again, and for us, a rerun of the Easter story. Maybe you've never heard the Easter story before, and this is all new to you, but for many of us, we've heard the Easter story very many times. And so as we approach the story, we see it differently uh, to people who uh, um, were there that first time. So let's this morning get into the passage in John's Gospel and try to get into the, the mind of Mary as she's there on that first day. Uh, we're going to see as we go through the Gospel um, that uh, it begins with a series of running races. Um, if you hadn't noticed that before, let me tell you what I mean. It's early on the first day of the week, which of course was Sunday. Um, back then, and uh, Mary Magdalene has gone to the tomb, and the stone has been rolled away. Uh, we don't get in John's Gospel detail about the stone um, and, and, the, uh, and the guards there at, at this point, um, but the stone's gone, um, and so um, Mary is the first one to go running. She goes running to Simon Peter. And the other disciple, it says here, the one Jesus loved. Well, the other disciple uh, is John, and you'll see um, John is the uh, author of the gospel, um, and he is a pretty modest chap. Um, he likes calling himself the disciple who Jesus loved. Um, and uh, um, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Uh, it sounds so simple when we read those words in English. They've taken the Lord and we don't know where they put him. Uh, for anyone who's ever lost anything uh, important, you know that sense of panic um, as you look around. Maybe if you've ever lost your mobile phone and you don't know where it is and uh, some bright spark in your house or your workplace says, well, why don't you just call it? because I put the thing on silent, <laughs> and it's not going to work. Um, and, uh, and so you can't find it, and you go around looking. Um, when we look for things, we tend to get into a bit of a state of panic. Um, and often we, we hope that we'll just see something, and we, we will, we'll be looking and looking and looking, and, and we start getting into that place of, of kind of wondering, are we ever going to find it? And we don't know quite how long this took for Mary uh, in, in, that, in that time. As we read it in the passage, it's quite quick. It takes two or three minutes, as you heard Roxanne read it. But in reality, it probably was a lot longer. So she's running to Simon Peter and the other disciple and says they've taken the Lord away. And so, um, so then Peter and the other disciple um, both decided they were going to run to the tomb. So they start running um, to the tomb. Uh, we don't know how far away they were. I'd imagine it was a few kilometers um, that they were going. And uh, it, it, John likes to point out when I said he was modest here in verse 4, both were running, but the other disciple outrun Peter and reached the tomb first. Uh, so he gets to the tomb, uh, Mr. Modest John, and he bends over, looks at the strip of linen, but didn't go in. So he kind of looks, but stands back. And then along comes Peter, who may be second in the race, uh, but he runs straight into the tomb. Um, and he notices that the strips of linen are lying there. And the strips that were around his head were in a different place um, to, the, to the strips that were around his body. It was all separately lying in place. The gospel almost intimating it was quite neat and uh, laid down there. Finally, the other disciple um, also went inside. So this is John again, goes inside. He saw and believed, it says here. But then in brackets, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So when I said we know the story, we know how it goes, um, we've heard it before. We celebrate the resurrection, in a sense, every Sunday um, at church. And so for those disciples, they, they were not at the point of quite understanding all of this as it's unfolding before them. So they saw that Jesus wasn't there, and they went back to where they were staying. Mary, meanwhile, is still waiting at the tomb. There's a sense that sometimes we just have to give things time. We just have to wait. 
Those disciples didn't really seem to want to hang around. Once they'd seen Jesus wasn't there, they went straight back to tell the others. But I guess Mary just thought, you know what, I'm just going to stay here. I'm going to sit here in this, uh, in this loss. Jesus, who had died on the cross and been buried, was now gone. There's something about um, seeing that that had happened uh, that would have been important. It's why we have funeral services with a coffin or a casket, so that we can see that somebody's died and they've been buried. So that whole uh, process had happened, and now the body was gone. Mary's there, crying outside the tomb, weeping, it says in verse 11. She looked into the tomb and she sees two angels wearing white. They asked her, why are you crying? They've taken my Lord away, she said. And I don't know where they've put him. At that moment, she turns round and she sees Jesus standing there. But she doesn't recognize it as Jesus. She thinks it's the gardener. And so when Jesus asks the same question, why are you crying? Who are you looking for? She says, look, if you've taken him somewhere, can you just at least tell me where you've put him? And Jesus says one word. And in this one word, Mary knows that it is him. That word, it's her name. Jesus says, Mary. I don't know if Jesus said Mary like that. But Jesus would have had a way of saying Mary. That meant that all he had to say was her name. And she would have recognized his voice. A bit like when you pick up the phone. And I, I still do this to talk about picking up the phone. Whereas really I should probably do this these days. But as you pick up the phone and, um, and hear somebody saying hello. Um, again, on these phones, you can see who's calling. But if it's a phone and you don't know who's calling and you hear somebody's voice, uh, they probably only have to say one or two words if you know them well and you'll know who it is that is, um, is calling. Mary recognized that it was Jesus by the way he said her name. Mary. She turns towards him and cries out to him. And he says, don't hold me for I haven't yet ascended. Straight away, Jesus begins to say, let's look to what's coming next. And so he gives Mary a job of going and telling the disciples that what is happening next. Go to my brothers and tell them, verse 17, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Two things there. Firstly, um, that word ascending. Jesus is talking about what's coming next. We know it was about 40 days um, after Easter. Uh, we celebrate Ascension Day on a Thursday. Um, and uh, that's 40 days after Easter when Jesus um, ascended into heaven. Um, and so she's going to tell the disciples that. But also, just look at what he says. I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. He's very clearly saying that the father to whom he's ascending isn't just his father. He's all of our fathers. He isn't just his God. He is our God. Jesus as the son of the father. Jesus in his humanity pointing to God. And so Mary goes and she runs to the disciples um, and she has that news. I have seen the Lord. And she tells them what he had said. Each Easter, we hear that story. We think of the confusion that they had of Jesus not being there. Of that faith uh, that we have that Jesus died and rose again for us. 
And each time at Easter, I guess it's a chance for us to reflect on what we think about that. What we think about Jesus who, who came and lived a human life with all its highs and lows and invites us to follow him. On Good Friday, as Jesus was nailed to the cross, we see our sin dying with him. All the sin, which is that which separates us from God, is taken away in Jesus' death on the cross. And as he goes down into the grave, he, he leaves uh, our sin there. And so because of Jesus, because of the cross, we can experience life in all its fullness. Jesus says in John 10, 10, I've come that they might have life and have life in abundance, life in all its fullness. The Greek word is pleromatos. The, the fullness of life is what Jesus brings. And so for us, we can understand um, that that's what Jesus was saying. But in that moment, for Mary, confusion turns to joy. We'll see later on in John's gospel what the disciples make of it. But this Easter, we have hope. We have hope in Jesus in the resurrection. We can trust that his words were true. He said, I'm going to die and on the third day I'll rise again. And so he has. And that hope that we have in Jesus plays out into the whole of our life. I've taken an awful lot of funerals in the last 10 years that I've been ordained. And uh, the difference, I believe, when I take a funeral as a Christian is that we speak of heaven. We talk of hope for a future. We can speak about eternal life. There's nowhere else you'll find eternal life um, in, in any other religion or faith. It comes straight from the Bible. And so we believe as Christians in eternal life and we have hope. And so as we move through uh, the, the COVID pandemic around the world, uh, we have hope. We have hope as Christians that you know, this too will pass. This thing will end. Life will get back to normal somehow. But more than that, we have hope in heaven ahead. So I invite you this Easter to reflect on Jesus on his resurrection. And just where you are, I'm going to pray now. Would you hold out your hands as a sign that you're ready to receive? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the joy of Easter Day. We thank you for the good news of your resurrection, that death was defeated, and that you bring life and life in all its fullness. We pray, Holy Spirit, you would fall afresh upon us this day. You would stir us up that we might hear your voice as you call our name, just as you call Mary's. So come amongst us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.